This is the British Isles, 400 years ago. But you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. Mass trials and executions erupted across the country. And the reason for the chaos and violence? Witches. People were convinced they sank ships, brought famine and disease, murdered and maimed. Because witches worked for Satan. Hundreds of innocent people were persecuted. About a witch? Tortured and put to death in a hysterical effort to stamp out the scourge of witchcraft. Imagine living in that world. You could be accused, tortured and executed on the basis of nothing more than gossip and superstition. How could such a deadly and violent idea have got so out of control in Britain? What drove the persecutors to such awful lengths? And what was it like for the victims who were tortured and executed for crimes they couldn't possibly have committed? For over a hundred years, shocking witch trials swept across the British Isles. And the most infamous figure in that whole terrifying century was Matthew Hopkins, Witchfinder General. Tell me the truth. I am your confessor. This is the sleepy village of Manningtree on the River Stour in Essex. In 1645, something apparently trivial happened here that grew to engulf this corner of England in a frenzy of paranoia that would leave more than a hundred innocent people dead. It all started with a sick woman. She was the wife of local tailor, John Rivett. On March 21st, 1645, Rivet petitioned two magistrates who were visiting Manningtree. He believed they could save her. My wife has been struck down by an all-consuming fever that threatens her life. At first, she complained of dizziness and nausea, but now she is confined to her bed. Her body flushed, hot and cold, her senses dulled. This is something more than merely natural. My wife is bewitched. To people of the time, this was a completely rational explanation. Witches were as real to them as the ground beneath their feet and the sun above their heads. They believed the devil made a pact with witches, sealed by sex. And that the devil gave witches supernatural powers to maim and to kill. People were terrified of them. In the 17th century, life was often nasty, brutish and short. Everyone was looking for someone to blame when things went wrong. So it makes sense that a person like John Rivet grasped witchcraft as an explanation for his wife's otherwise inexplicable illness. My wife is bewitched by Elizabeth Clark. <laughs> Elizabeth Clark was well known around Manningtree. She was around 80 years old, she was a widow, she was poor, and she had only one leg. She was also famously cantankerous, much given to cursing and with a quick temper. She wasn't well liked. Rivet wanted Elizabeth convicted and executed to save his wife. But even in the 17th century, accusations alone were not grounds for arrest. And so it might have ended there if it hadn't been for one man. Local landowner, John Stern. We have evidence to support John Rivet's claim. Stern carried eyewitness statements that would transform this from a minor local incident 
into a catastrophe. In the statements, locals said Elizabeth Clark had not only refused to deny being a witch, she'd also claimed to know plenty of other witches, so they'd better watch their tongues. Stern's eyewitness accounts changed everything. The magistrates gave Stern a warrant to investigate the claims. It backed him with the full weight of the law. He could use anything, short of torture, to question Elizabeth Clark and any other suspected witches living in Essex. Essentially, they'd given Stern, a man with no legal status at all, a freelance license to hunt down witches. It was this warrant that started the most brutal witch hunt in English history. But it wasn't Stern who would drive it. It was a young man standing quietly at the back of the room. His name was Matthew Hopkins. Matthew Hopkins was born in the 1620s. Though we don't know exactly what year, what we do know is that his father was a strict Puritan preacher. From an early age, Matthew would have been immersed in his father's faith. He was brought up to believe that it wasn't enough just to believe in Christ. He also needed to demonstrate his faith through public acts. And in that Manning Tree meeting room, Hopkins saw an opportunity to do just that. Hopkins offered to help Stern investigate Elizabeth Clark. But proving her guilty would not be easy. King Charles I had suppressed witch hunting by requiring extremely demanding standards of evidence. In the last 20 years, very few witches had been convicted. But Charles was now losing control and civil war had broken out. This violent chaos came as no surprise to the Puritans who dominated East Anglia. They were expecting it. They believed it signaled the end days, before the apocalypse, when the devil would walk the earth. So finding witches living amongst them was exactly what they had anticipated. This collision between the terrifying chaos of war and rigid Puritan beliefs created the perfect conditions for witch hunting. So Hopkins' opportunistic approach to Stern was perfectly timed. Stern accepted his help. Matthew Hopkins was on his way to launching the most brutal witch hunts in English history. Matthew Hopkins and John Stern, two men with no legal training whatsoever, had been given a warrant to interrogate suspected witch Elizabeth Clark. On Friday the 21st of March, 1645, a group of women chosen by Hopkins and Stern went to Elizabeth's cottage. The women stripped and searched her, looking for the devil's mark. Fine. People believed that the pact between the devil and the witch was consummated with sex. He would then mark her body. The devil often concealed these marks beneath the witch's body hair. The searchers would do whatever it took to find it. A devil's mark could be any skin blemish, a mole, even an age spot. So the chance of finding something on an elderly woman was pretty high. Finally, they found the mark, hidden on Elizabeth's genitals. This was an appalling level of casual brutality. Imagine the shame and humiliation for Elizabeth Clark. Remember, we're talking about an old and disabled woman. As a widow, she didn't even have the protection of a husband. But the mark alone wasn't enough. To be certain of a conviction, they needed Elizabeth to confess. Hopkins and Stern's warrant restricted them to operating within the law. <laughs> 
which excluded torture. So to get what they needed, they would have to be creative. Elizabeth Clark was tied to a chair and deprived of sleep. Wake up, old woman. In the 17th century, sleep deprivation by the thinnest of margins was legal. Are you a witch? No, not I. Hopkins' henchmen worked on Elizabeth in shifts, keeping her awake for three days and nights. Oh, wake up! <laughs> but Elizabeth Clark must have been tough as old boots because she still would not confess. On the third day, Hopkins and Stern paid her a visit. It was the first time Hopkins had come face to face with Elizabeth. Do you know who I am, old woman? I'm your confessor. When did you sign a pact with the devil? What sins have you committed in his name? Continue. Hopkins was never going to give up. It was all too much for Elizabeth. Stop. Please stop. Talk then, old woman. In what form did the devil come to you? He was a tall, proper, black-haired gentleman. A proper man than you yourself. He comes to me three or four times in a week to my bedchamber and go to bed with me. I never deny him. Imagine the depths of degradation to which Elizabeth had been exposed. She'd been brutalized, starved, and denied water and sleep. And although she was clearly made of strong stuff, the elderly widow finally broke. That gave her the dubious privilege of becoming Hopkins' first victim. And what Elizabeth did next doomed many more victims to follow her. She said that she was part of a coven. There were more witches out there for Hopkins to hunt down. After torturing Elizabeth Clark, Matthew Hopkins and John Stern used her confession to forge new careers for themselves, careers that had never previously existed in England. They became freelance witch hunters. Hopkins and Stern used the Manning Tree Warrant to begin hunting down the people Elizabeth Clark had named. Elizabeth was arrested in March. Six more arrests followed in April. By June, as Hopkins and Stern hit their stride, the number had swollen to at least 30. The suspects were brought here to Colchester Castle. Conditions in this jail were appalling. The prisoners were shackled day and night and routinely beaten by the guards. There was no light, no space, no sanitation. By June, four prisoners had already died, most probably from typhus. On the 17th of July, 1645, the survivors were herded onto carts bound for the courts at Chelmsford. For many of them, it wasn't the first time they'd been arrested for witchcraft, but previous cases had been dismissed for lack of evidence. Perhaps they expected the same result this time. If so, they reckoned without Matthew Hopkins' zeal. He was determined to rid the world of Satan's agents. Elizabeth Clark was tried with the first group of suspects. 
Hopkins recorded the details of the case himself. How do you plead? I am innocent. The court was an uproar. Silence! At the back, spectators heckled and hissed from the gallery, and the judge intervened whenever he saw fit. I will have silence! Then, into the chaos of the courtroom, stepped Matthew Hopkins. Clark was apprehended and searched, and found upon her three teeth. So upon command from the justice, they kept her from sleep two or three nights. Immediately after this, this witch confesses several other witches. Hopkins had something that recent trials had lacked, the confession that he'd extracted from Elizabeth. The confession of a witch, in my judgment, is enough to hang a witch. And Hopkins had a secret weapon to convict the rest of the coven. Her name was Rebecca West. He had singled her out in jail and offered her freedom if she gave evidence against the others. The alternative was conviction and death. So unsurprisingly, she accepted. We came to the house where there were five witches. They commanded their spirits, some to kill a man's horse, some to lame a cow, lame a child. Rebecca's testimony sealed the fate of the accused women. Culpabilis or non culpabilis? Corpus. Fifteen of the accused, including Elizabeth Clark, were found guilty and sentenced to death. Hopkins was victorious. It was the largest number of convictions in a single <laughs> witch trial in English history. On Friday the 18th of July, Elizabeth Clark, together with 14 other condemned women, was brought here to where the gallows stood in Chelmsford Market Square. No! I did it so many things! I didn't do it! I didn't do it! Elizabeth Clark had to be helped up to have the noose put round her neck. Because, of course, she only had one leg. Elizabeth Clark's only crime was to be poor, bad-tempered, and in the wrong place at the wrong time when Hopkins was launching his career. <laughs> Execution was by the short drop. The victims died slowly of strangulation. These deaths made Hopkins' reputation. He used this to transform himself into something new and terrifying. Hopkins gave himself a grand new title, Witchfinder General. He became unrecognisable from the man who had stood quietly at the back of the meeting room in Manningtree. This is a contemporary portrait of Hopkins. Notice what he's wearing. He's got a high crowned hat, boots, spurs, and he's carrying a staff. He's the very image of a respected country magistrate. When someone dressed like this walks into a room, people are going to sit up and pay attention. And I think it's obvious that Hopkins has dressed himself like this to have the appearance of authority. <laughs> 
I mean, what does a man in his 20s need with a staff except to have the symbol of a rank that he doesn't actually possess? In just four short months, Hopkins had become one of the most feared men in Eastern England. His career was on a meteoric path. In the previous 20 years, just two women had been executed for witchcraft in East Anglia. Culpabilis or non culpabilis? Culpabilis! Hopkins had now sent 15 to the gallows in a single day. This wasn't just good for God, it was good for business. Because Hopkins received a fee for every one. News of his success at the Chelmsford witch trials began to spread beyond Essex. This is All Saints Church in Brandeston, Suffolk. In 1645, the parishioners here published a pamphlet that accused a local man of witchcraft. Hopkins offered to help expose the witch, but he had absolutely no legal right to do so. Hopkins' original permission came from two magistrates in Essex, which meant he actually didn't have legal authority to operate in other counties, such as Suffolk. But Hopkins was clearly feeling very confident. And why not? Not only did he genuinely think that he was doing God's work, but also in the chaos of civil war, who exactly was going to stop him? This wasn't the only sign of Hopkins' growing confidence, because the witch he went after in Suffolk wasn't some poor, unloved, one-legged old crone. It was an ordained clergyman. Hello. Is there somebody there? Reverend John Lowe's had been the vicar at Brandeston for over 40 years. Hello? But he was so disliked that his parishioners described him as naught but a foul witch. How dare you! I am the man of God! Tackling such a conspicuous target was risky for Hopkins. Me. I am the man of God! No serving clergyman had ever been convicted of witchcraft in England. So in this case, more than any other, Hopkins simply had to get a result. Your parishioners think you're not but a witch. We'll see. As ever, what Hopkins needed was a confession. To extract a confession, Hopkins reused the procedure that had worked on Elizabeth Clark sleep deprivation. But Hopkins had refined his technique. Instead of tying John Lowe's to a chair, he made him run up and down the room every few minutes. Lowe's was walked constantly for days. Hopkins had successfully used sleep deprivation many times to get a confession. It was the most extreme technique he could legally apply. But this time, it had failed. Hopkins' new career was under threat. Hopkins had built an entire reputation on getting results when no one else could. So he took a momentous step. In order to get the results he wanted, he would break the law of the land. After all, in his mind, he was doing God's work. 
Hopkins had a problem. He could not get Vicar John Lowes to confess to witchcraft. It threatened to damage his flawless reputation for success. To win, Hopkins would now do absolutely anything, including breaking the law. On a freezing day in the winter of 1645, Hopkins' men dragged Vicar John Lowes, half naked and terrified, here to the moat at Framlingham Castle. To try and break Lowes, Hopkins used a technique known as swimming the witch. It came highly recommended. James I had written about it in his book, Demonology. He said that by accepting the devil, the witch rejected the sacred waters of baptism. And as a result, the water would reject the witch's body and he or she would float. If the suspect floated, he was a witch and should be executed. But if the suspect hadn't rejected the waters of baptism, then he would sink as the waters embraced him and he was proved innocent. Of course, there was also a great chance that he would drown. So by the time he arrived here, sink or swim, John Lodes was a dead man. Whatever James I may have said about this test, it was considered torture and therefore highly illegal. But Hopkins believed he could get away with it as long as it got results. This decision would come back to haunt him. The 80-year-old vicar was bound with ropes and thrown into the ice-cold moat. Face down, partially drowning, it must have been a terrifying ordeal. There's no record of how many times John Lowes was plunged into the water. All we do know is the torture finally broke him. I don't want to confess. My imps killed cattle and sank ships. Hopkins was victorious. But there was one thing Lowe's would not admit. I never made contact with the devil. No, my familiar tried to persuade me to do so. Like the other accused, Lowe's never confessed to making a pact with the devil. He gave Hopkins enough rope to hang him, but he never truly broke his covenant with God. He was, after all, a man of the cloth. You have to admire someone who clung to what he believed was right through the appalling sleep deprivation and partial drownings, and still would not yield that final inch. But Hopkins' gamble to use torture had paid off. And by the time Reverend Lowe's was hauled into court a few months later, Hopkins already had 90 other witches on trial on that same day. So the old minister's claims that he'd been tortured had no chance of a fair hearing. He was found guilty of being a witch and was sentenced to death. In the summer of 1645, as Reverend John Lowe stood at the gallows, awaiting his death, he read his own funeral service. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believeth in me, yea, though he were dead, yet he shall live. He had asked to do it himself. He probably didn't trust the ungodly people around him 
and who could blame him? had now had a sitting vicar convicted and executed. He was using interrogation techniques that were expressly banned by law, and he was operating in seven counties across the southeast of England, far beyond the legal limits of his original warrant. And no one stopped him. And I suspect there's a good reason for that. What's really interesting about his success is that although Hopkins called himself a witch finder, he didn't actually have to find a single witch. Locals were doing all that for him. Look at Elizabeth Clark. The local community essentially offered her up on a plate. She was bad-tempered and poor, a charity case who was a drain on village resources, and all she offered in return was cursing and swearing. And John Lowe's parishioners hated him so much, they published a pamphlet denouncing him as a witch. How much easier life would be if people like that simply disappeared? It's hard to avoid the conclusion that towns and villages were using the witch hunts as a form of social cleansing, and Matthew Hopkins was simply the well-paid instrument of their will. By the summer of 1646, Villages and towns across the southeast of England were clamoring for Hopkins' help. In July, he was in Norwich, where 20 witches met their end. In September, he was in Yarmouth, where 11 more were tried. Hopkins scored more successes at Yoxford, Wesselton, and Great Glenham. At its widest, his territory now spanned 300 miles. Hopkins was now overseeing hundreds of interrogations and attending countless trials. And he was receiving a fee for every one. But this success was storing up trouble for the witch finder. The first warning signs can be found here in the archives of the East Suffolk Records Office. These are accounting ledgers from 1645 and 1646. They detail payments made to Hopkins. In King's Lynn, they pay 15 pounds to Mr. Hopkins for interrogating suspected witches. And a few weeks later, they give him another three pounds for acting as a witness. In Alderborough, we have him paid on a regular basis. So we have here on the 8th of September to Mr. Hopkins, a gratuity for being in town for finding out witches of two pounds. He's paid the same amount on the 20th of December and again on the 7th of January. And here in Stowmarket, we have that he's paid 23 pounds in the spring of 1646. Matthew Hopkins may have started out doing God's work, but he had turned it into a very lucrative business. And the Witchfinder General's fee wasn't the only cost. These accounts from Audeborough tell us how much it cost to execute a witch. So this reference here says, to William Daniel for the gallows and setting them up, one pound. And for Henry Lawrence, the roper for seven halters and for making the knots, eight shillings. We've got a cost here for the sundry men for watching days and nights over the witches, 13 shillings and tenpence. In total, it adds up to something like 40 pounds, which would have been a seventh of the town's yearly income. And to pay it, the town had to raise a massive additional tax. And it seems that this was a pattern that was repeated wherever Hopkins went. In short, Matthew Hopkins, Witchfinder General, was starting to hit people where it mattered, in their pockets. 
Matthew Hopkins' reign of terror was about to come crashing down around him. Matthew Hopkins' career as a freelance witch hunter had been a spectacular success. I'm your confessor. In just two years, Search him. he'd been responsible for the torture and execution of hundreds of accused witches. But this success would ultimately bring him down. People began to complain about the executions. It wasn't the killing they minded, it was the cost. At Brandeston in Suffolk, for example, parishioners refused to pay for the execution of their own vicar, John Lowe's. People with serious objections to the witchfinder's cruel methods now joined the growing chorus of opposition against him. One man in particular would go to any lengths to bring him down. John Gall was a Puritan preacher here in the village of Great Staunton. He hated everything that Matthew Hopkins stood for. And when he heard that the witchfinder general was planning to come to his parish, he began to preach openly against him. of Witchfinder is exceedingly doubtful. A trade that was not taken up in England till this time. It was risky for a lowly priest to take on the superstar status of Hopkins, but Gore was too angry to care. Before he discovers what? He accused Hopkins of incompetence and self-interest. Hopkins' response to Gould's sermons was to go on the attack. He wrote to one of Gould's parishioners warning of the consequences of disagreeing with him on the matter of witches. He writes, I have known a minister in Suffolk preach as much against their discovery in a pulpit and forced to recant it in the same place. This letter was a thinly veiled threat. He was reminding Reverend Gould that he'd already sent one vicar, John Lowe's, to the gallows. He could easily do it again. But Hopkins was being overconfident. Gore wasn't intimidated. Instead, he went public. This is a copy of the book that John Gore wrote. It's called Select Cases of Conscience Touching Witches and Witchcraft. And in it, he says that Hopkins is just choosing easy targets. He says, Every old woman with a wrinkled face, a furrowed brow, a hairy lip, a gobber tooth, a squint eye, a squeaking voice, or a scolding tongue, and a dog or cat by her side is not only suspected, but pronounced for a witch. Gore went on to say that Hopkins had lucratory skill, which is to say the whole thing was a money-making scheme, that the witch finder had no special skill or ability and was a job that Hopkins had simply invented. It was a pretty damning attack. When Gore's book was published, it caught the attention of a group of influential Norfolk gentlemen. When they read it, they were outraged. In spring 1647, they went into open court in Norwich to present their objections to visiting Westminster judges. Hopkins' abusive techniques and his cavalier attitude to the law would be his undoing. They must be tortured. Make them say anything, which is a way to tame a wild colt. Besides this unnatural watching, they were extraordinarily warped till their feet were blistered. And so through that cruelty, forced to confess. Hopkins' wisest course of action would probably have been to ignore the accusations. But they had thrown down a gauntlet, and Hopkins picked it up. <laughs> 
he printed the accusations in a pamphlet alongside his defense. It was a disastrous mistake. This is an original copy of Matthew Hopkins' pamphlet. It's called The Discovery of Witches, and in it he prints the allegations made by the Norfolk gentleman against him, alongside his responses. This one says, all that the witch finder doth is to fleece the country of their money. money. Therefore he rides, goes to towns to have employment, promises them fair promises, but it maybe doth nothing for it. Hopkins denies everything. I demand but 20 shillings a town. And that is the great sum it takes me to maintain a company with three horses. We know from the surviving financial records that Hopkins was lying. He was routinely paid far more than 20 shillings. But the most astonishing thing about this book is that he reprints accusations of illegal torture. There have been an abominable, inhumane, and unmerciful trial of these poor creatures by tying them and heaving them into the water, a trial not allowable by law or conscience, and I would fain know the reasons for that. Hopkins justified his use of torture by quoting King James's book, Demonology. King James, in his Demonology, saith, it is a certain rule, for saith he, witches deny their baptism when they covenant with the devil. So Hopkins' justification was that James, a king who had been dead for 22 years, had once approved of swimming witches. This was no kind of legal defense. Hopkins failed to appreciate the danger of publicizing the accusations of illegal torture and of fleecing the public. Demand for his skills evaporated. The Witchfinder General had hunted his last witch. <coughs> we'll never know if Hopkins would have ended up in court for breaking the law, because fate intervened first. On Thursday, the 12th of August, 1647, <coughs> in the village where his spectacularly bloody career began barely two years earlier, Hopkins died. Most probably of tuberculosis. In his short career, he'd been responsible for the death of over a hundred innocent people. Perhaps Hopkins truly believed he was doing God's work, but he was also a ruthless opportunist who used the persecution, suffering, and death of innocent people to make his name and fortune. The hatred and hysterical fear of witches that he kindled was not easily extinguished. Over the next hundred years, more than 500 innocent people were arrested, tried, and hanged in the British Isles as witches. Hopkins' malign influence even crossed the Atlantic. A trial 45 years after his death advocated the course that hath been taken in England for the discovery of witches. Hopkins had found new admirers in a small East Coast town in the Americas. It was called Salem. The 20 witches executed there added to Hopkins' legacy of suffering 